you're doing well, enjoying your Labor Day weekend. I don't know if you know that or not, Dane, but that's one of the few songs in the book that's actually written by a Church of Christ guy, is uh, There Is a Habitation, actually written by a member of the church. So uh, anyway, it's good to see you this morning, and I'm glad to be with you, and hope that you're well. You know, we build a house with our lives, and we live in that house. I want to talk about that a little bit this morning, about living in the house that we build. And I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but hopefully you will by the time I'm done with it. But you know, the truth is, brethren, is that you and I are influenced by the world around us, by things that happen to us. From the time we're born to the time we die, our lives, things change. Our view of things change. Our view of people change. Circumstance changes. Our prejudices change. Our, a lot of things about us go through a metamorphosis as we live throughout our lives. And if you think about a young child or a baby that's just born, you know, they live in a glass house, don't they? And it's perfect, isn't it? It's not marred by anything. Their view of the world is crystal clear. Hasn't been affected by things happening to them or by what people say or how people act or by things that happen to us in this life. They haven't known tragedy or heartache. They haven't known hurt. They haven't known any of those things within their lives. And that child lives in a perfect house, in a perfect glass house. You and I do too when we're born, aren't we? We start out that way. What happens to us throughout life? How do we wind up where we are? Well, what happens is, is it's not too long after we're born. Hopefully we get spared for a while. But it's not too long after we're born that somebody comes along and throws a rock at our house, don't they? You know, they abuse us or they mistreat us. They, maybe they bully us. They do something that affects us. And when they do, it changes our view of the world, doesn't it? It has to. We begin to see good and evil. We begin to see good and bad. And sometimes as a child, especially if we're not in a great environment, those lines can become kind of blurred, can't they? Our view of reality, our view of the world, it is affected by what goes on around us. And in some ways we can control that and in some ways obviously we can't. And those things that happen to us, especially as young people, as children, have a huge impression upon our life, don't they? I don't know how your childhood was whether it was good or bad or whether it was ideal or not, I don't have any idea about your childhood. I know that childhood can be a traumatic time for children. A lot of our children aren't raised in the best environments, in the best homes. They're not given sometimes the nurture and support that we would like them to have. And even children who are raised in good homes often still go through traumatic experiences within their lives. My sister was sexually molested when she was a young child. She carried that with her her entire life. What a tremendous burden for a child to bear. What a tremendous burden. And I know people in this congregation that have had that happen to them. I know, and I'm sorry for that. I know that other things happen within your lives, things that you that you carry. If you think to your childhood with me, think about a really traumatic event in your childhood. Do you have one of those? I'm going to share one with you. This is actually the easiest story for me to share because this actually still bothers me a lot and it happened, you know, 50 years ago and I'm still, uh, this still is traumatic to me, but I want to share this with you. I was on a fishing trip with my dad at Lake Powell in uh, Utah and and it was one of them perfect days, you know. 
I know if any of you are a fisherman, I'm not much of a fisherman anymore. I've decided it's way too much like work. But the truth is, is that it was a perfect day. Me and my dad were fishing, and we were using water dogs. I don't know if you know what water dogs are, but they're salamanders, and you put them on a hook, and you, and you fish with them. And, man, we got into these bass. It was unbelievable. And we were catching five- and six-pound bass, just one right after the other till we ran out of bait. And my dad told me when we were doing it, he says, son, he says, you need to remember this day because this will never happen to you again in your life. And he's right, never has. Never, never have I caught fish like that ever in my life again. So we got back, and my dad, I always had to clean the fish. My dad always had to drink. I cleaned the fish. And so we got back to the, to the deal, and I had this huge bunch of fish. And when you fish there, there's these big cleaning stations that you have that are under these awnings with with faucets and everything, and you clean fish with a bunch of people, everybody that's caught fish. And my dad had told me before he did that, I don't know why my dad would do this to me, my dad said, he said, Rex, he says, don't tell him where we caught these fish. He says, you tell him we caught them over there. I don't know why, I wasn't always going to go back and catch more fish. You don't ask those questions when you're eight or nine years old. Your dad says, don't do it, so you don't do it. So I was cleaning my fish, having a time, or was admiring this great catch of fish. I was cleaning along. My stepmother, who probably had a little too much to drink, too, in the middle of cleaning his fish, where'd you catch them fish? I told him exactly what my dad told me. We caught them over here. I can't remember where that was now. We caught them over at this place. And in the middle of all this, my stepmother walks up. She says, why don't you tell him the truth? Why are you lying to him? Tell him where you really caught them fish. I was about eight years old. I didn't know what to do. I was sitting there with all these people. It devastated me. You know, it's not really a tragic thing. It didn't change my life. But the truth is, that's what happens to you, isn't it? People throw rocks at your window. And when you do that, you get where you don't trust people. You get where you, you're, a little more, you're a little more edgy. You don't trust people like you used to. You realize that life doesn't always go like you want it to. And that happens repeatedly in our lives, doesn't it? And as we do that, we put up walls within our lives. We put up barriers. We protect ourselves. We, we try to, to do and say what people want us to do and say. We try not to make waves. And, we, and it affects us who we are, inherently who we are. And as we become adults, it doesn't really change. It probably gets worse. People say things to us. People do things to us. We live through tragedies in our lives. And all those things affect our being. They affect our soul, our psyche, who we are on God's level. And it affects our Christianity. It affects our faith. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Is how that affects our faith and affects our relationship with God and with one another. And how you and I as Christians need sometimes to learn how to clean our glass. We need sometimes to learn how to get past those things that have abused us and hurt us in our lives and those things that have happened to us. And we need to move forward with that to be inherently the people that God wants us to be. Because I want to tell you something this morning. As we go through life and these things happen to us, it conditions us to act in a certain way. I want to tell you this morning, and you're not going to, this isn't going to work for me here because you people know me too well, and unfortunately this illustration won't work, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I'm going to use it anyway. And if I was to come to you this morning, and I was to say, and I was to ask you all, how are you doing this morning, brother? How are you doing, sister? And you're going to say, what are you going to say to me? Now, you know me, so you know you're not, I know this isn't going to work because you know I use this example. But you're going to say, I'm fine. I'm good. Everything's great. Now, aren't you? Isn't that what you're going to say 99% of the time? Is it true all the time? No, but you're going to say it. Why? Because you've conditioned yourself to that. You've conditioned yourself to this idea that I need to be fine. I need to be okay. Why have you done that? Because as a child, you often heard that nobody wants to hear you cry. Nobody wants to hear your problems. Nobody's concerned about you, right? You just, you, nobody wants to see you make waves. Why are you causing trouble? Go along, right? Go along. We hear that as a child. You know, don't cause trouble. And so we do that, and we condition ourselves to be the people that we expect everyone wants us to be, don't we? We condition ourselves for it. Because I want to get along with you. You want to get along with me. We want to be civil. And we condition ourselves to be a certain way, and we condition ourselves to protect ourselves, and we condition ourselves 
to get through life without getting hurt anymore, without getting damaged, without anybody affecting. But the truth is we're all damaged. We're all damaged. We've all had stuff happen to us. And it's clattered our view that God would have us of the world and of people around us. We become skeptical. And the older we get, the worse it gets. And I always wondered that. And I'm an old person now, so I guess I can say this. Why are old people so crabby? Right? You know, I can say that because I'm an old person. My wife says I'm crabby sometimes, and I am. Why? Because I've had a lot of rocks thrown out my window. That's why. Haven't you? I've had a lot of rocks thrown out my window. I know what it's like. I know what the world's like. Yeah, I'm kind of skeptical. I'm kind of a cynic sometimes. I'll be the first one to admit it. My kids are, they're, uh, skepticism runs off my family like water off a duck. I mean, literally, it's part of who we are. And I, and you know, why is it that way? Because I've conditioned myself to be that way. And I have to try real hard sometimes not to be that way. And the older I get, the worse it is, right? The worse it is. Because I've had a lot of rock sewn at my window, have you? And it's distorted my view sometimes of what's good and what's, n- what's not, and it's conditioned me to be a certain way. We're no different than that dog, aren't we, with conditioning. You know, the idea in the old experiment of the dog, right, where you, where you blow the whistle and feed the dog and blow the whistle and feed the dog, and eventually you blow the whistle and the dog just starts to salivate because he knows the food's coming. Well, you and I are no different than that. We act, we talk. We react to people in a certain way because we've conditioned ourselves because of what's happened in our lives to act that way. There's no denying it. It's how we are. When somebody comes up to you and wants money, when somebody comes up to you and wants you to help them, be due to the experience you've had doing that is how you will react to that individual. Not based on them, but based on your experience of what's happened to you in the past. But you see, the problem is, is we're Christians. And Jesus expects us to act and behave in a certain manner, doesn't he? He expects us to be a certain kind of person. And unfortunately, the things that happen in my life move me away from the person that God desires me to be. Because my view of the world has become damaged. It's become skewed by the things that have happened to me, the things that have occurred to me. Am I as trusting a person as I was 30 years ago? No, I'm not. I'm not. Am I as nice a person as I was 30 years ago? Honestly, I'm probably not. Probably not. Why? Why? Because life has happened in 30 years. And it has to you too, hasn't it? And so we have to ask ourselves this inherent question. What do I have to do to be back to where God wants me to be? To have the view of people and the view of the world that God wants me to have. Because I'm telling you, brethren, we're a skeptical people. We are. We're not trusting anymore, are we? You think you're as trusting as you were 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Do you? Just be honest with me. No. Because the world's moving us away from that. The world's moving us to where the world thinks we need to be, and yet Christ is still calling us home. You see, Jesus met a woman at a well in Samaria. It's an amazing story in the Bible on a lot of different levels. But one of those things is that she's a Samaritan. Jews hated Samaritans. They were half-breeds. Worship, didn't worship in Jerusalem. Jews hated them. Why did they hate the Samaritans so bad? Because their whole life, from the time they were a little bitty, you know what they'd been told? Samaritans are half-breeds. They're bad. They're no good. They don't like us. We don't like them. They were throwing rocks at their window from a really young age. And when that happens from the time you're young, it's hard to get over it. And prejudice and bias come in a thousand different forms. 
And if we're taught that as a child, we have a hard time overcoming it. Yet God calls us to do it. And Jesus sees this woman, this Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus, most Jews wouldn't even go through Samaria. They went around the wilderness because they didn't even want to interact with the Samaritan. When Jesus uses the story of the good Samaritan, we call it. Why did he use the Samaritan? Because of all the people that helped the Jew, it was the Samaritan, the one they hated the most, that actually helped. And when Jesus got done with the story, and I think it's powerful in the, in the text, when Jesus got done with the story, he says, who was the man's brother? And the Jew asked the question. He didn't even say the Samaritan. He couldn't even say that. He couldn't say the words. The Sam- oh, yeah, I can't say that. So he said, the one who helped him. It's easier to say that. Because that hatred was so deep. And Jesus, he goes to Samaria and he goes to this woman. And, and most men didn't talk to women like this anyway or associate with them. And everything about this is against what Jesus was conditioned as a Jew to do and conditioned as a Jew to be. And yet Jesus was being the opposite of what every Jew around him thought he should be. You see? And the point of it is this. We can be conditioned one way. We can condition ourselves one way to act one way, to talk one way, to respond to something one way. But the truth is, with God, we can act different than what we're conditioned ourselves to do. Jesus talks to this woman, and, and he says, the Samaritan woman, he says, she says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? I am a Samaritan woman. And then it's funny. I always think parenthetical statements in text are funny because there really isn't any parentheses in the Greek. But it says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Why are you different? Why are you And the reason I bring this up is because the reason we don't reach people in the world as Christians that we should reach a lot of times is because we've conditioned ourselves. Think with me for just a minute. We already conditioned ourselves to know how they're going to respond to us. And we're not going to take a chance. You with me? So when you go to talk to somebody about Christ or you see somebody and you want to reach them for Jesus or you want to have an influence on them as a Christian, and you really want to do it, but in the back of your mind, you've conditioned yourself to what they're going to say. They're going to reject me. They're going to call me a Bible thumper. They're going to call me a do-gooder. They don't want to hear what I have to say. You've conditioned yourself, and because of it, we don't spread the gospel. Oh, I do the same thing. I'm not immune. We've conditioned ourselves. Jesus could have went to the woman at the, when that woman sat down, he could have said, there's no sense of me talking to this. Of course, Jesus knows the heart of people. I understand this, but bear with me for a minute. Jesus could have said, well, there's no sense in me talking to that Samaritan woman. She's not going to listen to what I have to say anyway. Samaritans hate Jews. I'm wasting my time. Why would I even bother talking to her? You see, I do the same thing with people. We all do the same thing with people. Oh, I would like to tell them about Jesus, but I know what they're going to say. Do we? Or have we just conditioned ourselves to the point that that's our out. It's easier not to say anything than to risk being rejected. Because we've conditioned ourselves to the world. The world as we see it. The world as it's affected us. Why do I think everybody's going to reject the gospel? Because a lot of times when we tell people, what do they do? When I was a child and I was young and I was impressionable and I would go hand out flyers at doors about the gospel or church or Jesus, 
and people would not want to open the door, slam the door in my face. And as a child, that shattered my glass. It threw rocks at me. And I come to the conclusion that nobody wants this. But that's not true. But that's, in my mind, that's what I conditioned myself to believe. You know, it's funny. I go to Henrietta. I, when I, we had kids at school, I, always, I thought it was amazing to me. I would, I would see all those kids going into that school, filing in there, parents dropping them off, all them kids going into that school. And I would think of all those kids, isn't there some of those kids that would accept Jesus, that need Jesus out of all those kids, out of the multitude? You know, it's funny, isn't it, how we group things together, people together. Oh, none of them care. None of them would want that. You know, there's one thing I've learned in life. There's no absolutes. Believe me. There's no absolutes. There's always somebody that wants to listen, somebody that needs what you have to give them. But if we never offer it, if we never try, they're never going to receive what it is that we have. And Jesus said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And she said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? You gave us the well and drank of it himself, his sons and his cattle. And Jesus answered and said, everyone who drinks this water will never thirst again. And whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I give will become in him a well of water, spring up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water. So I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. And you see, the reason I bring this up is because just as much as Jesus should have been conditioned not to listen to her, she was conditioned to what to say to him. She, she had the response. She was looking for the physical, the idea, the response to give him. She wasn't looking towards him in the spiritual realm. She wasn't looking towards what he really had to give her. As often happens with Jesus, she tried to explain it away in a way she could understand. You don't have a way to draw. Are you greater than Jacob? I don't understand what, what you're trying to say to me because we are conditioned ourselves to look at the world in a way we can understand it. We can make sense of it. We talked about Lazarus and the death of Lazarus this morning when Jesus came to the tomb and, and Mary and Martha were there and they both said the same thing to him. If you'd have been here, our brother would not have died. They couldn't get past that. They couldn't go beyond that, yet Christ expects us to look beyond what's possible, what's reasonable, what we think can happen. Jesus expects us to look past that. Jesus expects us to look to things that you and I can't understand or explain. Jesus expects for us to see what he can do in our lives and the lives of others. You see, we've conditioned ourselves, and the older we get, the more we do it. The more people throw rocks at us, the more we get hardened to the world around us, the more we can't see the beauty of life and the beauty of things, and we lose our joy, and we lose our happiness, and we lose our state of being because of the damage that's been caused by us. And yet Jesus is telling us to get past that. Jesus is telling us to clear our window, to replace our glass, to look at the world not through, not through brokenness, and that's what we do. We look at the world through our brokenness. He tells us to look at the world through his eyes. Because Jesus doesn't see the world like you and I see it. Jesus hung on that cross and saw a world that deserved to be saved. And you and I look at the world and see a world that's lost. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's because we've conditioned ourselves to the idea that we can't change the people around us. And that's not true. If you and I would see the world and the people in it as worthy of salvation, of those that could be saved. It would change how we act. But brethren, I don't know about you, 
most days I see the world as lost. Do you? You see, Jesus wants us to look at it through his eyes. The value of souls, the value of one soul. You and I have to condition ourselves differently. And in order to do that, we have to get past us. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five. And the one whom you have now is not your husband. This you have truly said truly. You know, Jesus accepted what she was, who she was. When Jesus knew that she was living in an adulterous state, for a Jew, that was a punish, that was an offense punishable by death. This Jesus who preached a sermon on the mount before this and said that we shouldn't divorce and that if you look after a woman and lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart, is the same Jesus who is offering salvation to this woman at the well. Have we forgotten that? The same Jesus who is looking on her with compassion and looking on her with a clean slate and open eyes and saying, I have water to give you that you'll have eternity. That's this Jesus. We forget that sometimes. That same Jesus who preached the Sermon on the Mount and condemned divorce and we look at that passage and condemned adultery. It's the same Jesus who sat with this woman at the well and saying, there's eternal life for you. There's grace for you. There's mercy for you. You and I are so quick to judge, so quick to condemn. Jesus looked at a woman who should have been condemned for every reason and said, there's grace and there's mercy for you. There's eternity for you. We should never forget, just by grace, brethren, by grace, that we have life. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. The reason I brought this up is because so many people in the Bible wanted Jesus to say, I'm the Messiah. Didn't they? They asked him, who are you? Who are you? And he wouldn't tell them. And Jesus didn't reveal himself to all those people, did he? He didn't say, I'm the Messiah. And it's funny to me, the one person in the Bible, well, I guess you could say two, that Jesus revealed himself to and actually said, I'm the Son of God. It was a Samaritan woman, an adulterous Samaritan woman at a well. I don't think you can get past that. Can you? You and I, brethren, we have to look at people different. We have to look at the world like Jesus looks at it. That there's people that need to be saved. And yeah, a lot of them are going to reject you, and a lot of them are going to put you off, and a lot of them are going to laugh at you and scorn you, and they're going to do all those things that's been done to me a hundred times in my life. But isn't all that worth the one? Isn't all that worth the woman at the well? Yeah. But you and I have to convince ourselves that that woman exists in our lives. The woman who really, or the man, or the person who really needs Jesus. You know, Zacchaeus was the other guy, wasn't he? I thought about when I thought about this lesson. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he, and he crawled up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down from that tree. The tax collector, the one everybody looked over, the one that was so short, everybody looked over because he was short, but they looked over because he was a tax collector. The wealthy man who Jesus knew needed him. The one Jesus had every reason not to talk to, but the one that he chose to talk to. The one everybody hated. You know, I want to tell you a little story about Zacchaeus. History tells us that Zacchaeus did exactly what he told Jesus he would do. He, He made retribution to all those he had wronged. 
And Zacchaeus ended his life as the bishop of Caesarea. Do you know that historically? Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the wee little man, the one everybody hated, but the one Jesus knew needed Jesus. You see, brethren, it's the ones sometimes we look over in our life, the ones we think that we can't convert, the ones we think that will never listen, the ones we think there's no use. Sometimes those are the ones that are waiting for you to say something to them. Sometimes those are the ones that are ready to come to Jesus. They're the ones who are looking for him. You know, I think back to that story of my childhood. That story still hurts me. That's 50 years ago. That story still bothers me. I hate to even tell you. I was so ashamed. I was so ashamed standing there. I'm still ashamed. I was ashamed. I'm still ashamed about it. 50 years later, I'm ashamed. But the truth is, brethren, if God can forgive us, we can forgive ourselves. You know, sometimes we're hardened to this world and the things that have shattered our glass and our windows. Sometimes the hardest person to forgive and all the things that happen to us is us. Our guilt, our blame, our fault, even for things that really weren't our fault, we still blame ourselves for them. We still hold that guilt. I do. And Jesus says, in order to be the person to see the world through clean glass and through the eyes I need you to look, you need to forgive yourself. You need to forgive yourself. If I can forgive you, you can forgive you. And I think sometimes in life we're the hardest people to forgive. We have to look deeper than the preconception. I was going to Tech a long time ago, many years ago. I went to school at Tech in Okmulgee. I was in diesel and heavy equipment. We had a guy in there, a kid in there. He stank every day. It was terrible. We couldn't hardly stand to be around him. He never changed his clothes. It was awful. We made terrible fun of him. One day, a bunch of guys got together. Thankfully, I can tell you I wasn't in on this. I'm not going to say that I didn't approve, but I wasn't in on it. And we had these big bird bath hand washing stations. And we had the Zep floor soap. It was caustic floor soap. You ever use this or not? It's really terrible stuff. And we had these really stiff brooms. And so a bunch of guys one day got together. They threw him in the bird bath. They took that caustic soap. They took those shop brooms. They scrubbed him down, washed him off, took him out. A bunch of them did it. I wasn't in on it, I'm telling you. Heard about it two or three days later. Had an instructor up there. His name was Gene Claiborne. I think he's still alive. I love Gene. Gene came to me about a week after that. He says, Rex, he says, I want to tell you about this guy. And I said, okay. And he said, you know, after that happened, he says, I figured I need to go find out about this guy. So he says, I went to where he lives. And, he says, and the guy is, literally has no money. He has nothing to eat, and he has only one set of clothes. He lives in a little one red one bedroom kind of apartment thing. There's no place for him to do his laundry. There's no shower in this little apartment. It's just a room with a sink. And Gene says, so I go, I went to the kid, and he said, and I went and bought the kid another set of clothes. He says, and I, I went to the kid, and I told him, I said, here's you some laundry soap. He says, wash your clothes you don't wear that day in the sink and hang them up to dry. When you come in that night, he says, put them underneath your mattress and sleep on them. So the next day your clothes will be will look good. He says, and put them clothes on the next day. And that way, you and wash in the sink, and he bought him some soap, and he bought him some stuff and some toiletries. And I never felt so bad in my life. Because our perception of that guy was so wrong. We thought he was that way because he chose to be that way. And we didn't know he was that way because he didn't have any choice. Brethren, don't judge people without looking beneath the surface. You don't know. You don't know a person until you know a person. The problem is, is we've conditioned ourselves, haven't we? Conditioned ourselves to pass judgment on people before we really know who they are and what they're going through. Brethren, you and I have to clean our glass, and we have to look deeper than our preconception. And brethren, we have to use our past as a springboard forward not an anchor. You know, I've got a lot of bad stories in my life I could share with you, and you've got a lot in your life that you could share with me. Some of them are a little bit comical at this point in my life, I'll tell you right now, because looking back, they're kind of funny, but at the time, they really wasn't funny at all, 
right? But the truth is, is that even that story that I told you of my dad and what happened to me at that lake and that thing that still stays with me, you know, I could use that and, and dwell on that, but that in my life has taught me one thing. I need to tell the truth in spite of what other people tell me because there's a consequence when you lie. You know, the truth is, is that that's even been a thing that's helped me in my life. Even tragedy can help you in your life. Even bad things can help you in your life if you'll take the lessons that you learn. And instead of using that to, to cloud your judgment and cloud your view and break your window, if you'll use that to help you to clean that and to spring you forward to be a better person than you were in the past. Because that's what Jesus expects you and I to do. He doesn't expect us. He didn't die. Jesus Christ did not die so that you and I could live in the past. He died so that you and I could embrace our future. And he died so that you and I could lead others to him. Brethren, you and I, we got a cleaner window. We got a cleaner window. We got to look at the world through the eyes of Jesus. Because there's people out there that need you to tell them about Christ, whether you believe it or not. There's people out there that need you to tell them about Jesus Christ. If we can help you in any way today, if you need the prayers of this church, if we can assist you in any way, won't you let it be known while we stand?